So thank you for joining us today for our Natasha's Law Labelling Masterclass. My name is Rachel Sortel and I'm the Marketing Director for Planglow and I'll be hosting the webinar today, which we are running in collaboration with Eridus. We're excited to say that we have reached maximum capacity today of 500 participants, so we know that this is a hot topic for everyone at the moment. Since the announcement of Natasha's Law, we've been helping thousands of customers to get compliant and so our aim for this session is to help share our experience and for you to leave this webinar today feeling confident and able to tackle Natasha's Law with ease. We have a great lineup for you today, so we'll quickly run through the agenda and our key speakers. So first we are joined by Arvin Tandy from the Food Standards Agency, who will be explaining the allergen labelling changes that will go live in October 2021. Next we have Andrew Stevenson, Head of Support for Eridus. Andrew will be talking through the scope and integrity of the Eridus data used in Planglo's Label Logic Live application. Later on, he'll also be talking through best practice for caterers when it comes to minimising the risk of allergens in the kitchen. Next, we are joined by myself and Kai Mundy from Planglo support team. I will be giving a short intro to Planglo and then Kai will be running through the Label Logic Live application and demonstrating how simple it is to get Natasha's law compliant. Finally, we are joined by Paula Young from Petrol College, who has been through the process of getting Natasha's Law compliant and will be explaining how they manage allergen risk in practice. We'll be rounding it all up with a Q&A session with all of our panellists, plus Stephen Hendry from Food Standards Scotland. Thanks to those of you that have sent through your questions already. If anyone has any questions during the webinar, feel free to post them in the Q&A box. We will try and answer as many of them as we can during the Q&A panel session at the end but any that we are unable to get through will be posted on our websites after the event. So let's get started by introducing Arvin Tandy from the Food Standards Agency. Again, just to state, I'm Arvin Tandy. I work in the Food Standards Agency um, and I work in the food hypersensitivity team and our work covers food allergies, intolerances and celiac disease. And this work is a key priority for the FSA and we've set out an ambition of making the UK the best place in the world to be a food hypersensitive consumer. And a new, very important area of work for us this year naturally is the pre-packed for direct sale allergen labelling changes also known as Natasha's Law. Um, and as you'll know this change was introduced following the tragic death of Natasha Eden Laperouse um, after eating a baguette um, in which sesame was present. Um, we've uh, ourselves and other administrations um, across the UK have uh, now got uh, legislation in place for PPDS food and the aim of this legislation is to benefit consumers by telling them what is in the packaged food they are eating and will allow them to make safer food choices. Um, I don't think the slides have come up in slide so show form, just try again. Um, Okay, that seems to have worked. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, so just this first slide illustrates um, the three categories of food in terms of um, allergen labeling. We can consider them as pre-packed food, non-pre-packed food, and also pre-packed for direct sale food. So at the moment, pre-packed for direct sale food is pretty much um, treated in the same way as non-pre-packed food. Um, and the allergen information requirements are the same. Um, but from 1st of October, PPDS food will be more in line with pre-packed food and has labelling requirements that make it more similar to pre-packed food. So in terms of the current allergen labelling and allergen information rules, um, currently allergen information for pre-packed for direct sale food is, as I said, provided in the same way as non-pre-packed food. And this is in line with legislation that came into force in 2014. Um, so for non-pre-packed food, you have to provide information on the 14 major allergens, but you have some discretion on how it's presented to the consumer to take account of different business models. Um, so you could have, um, as illustrated here, a notice up saying that you should ask staff for more information, um, or you could have a specific allergen menu or allergen book. So in terms of the definition of pre-packed for direct sale food, it applies to food that has been packed on the same premises or site from which it has is being sold before it is ordered by the customer. 
And um, so we use the term the same premises, or it can be same site, and this can refer to a building complex, such as a shopping centre or airport terminal, where the same food business operates from more than one unit. And it does also apply to um, mobile sellers. So if you offer the food for a sale um, from a temporary premises, such as a marquee or a market stall, um, if the food is offered for sale by the same food business that packed it, it does also come under the PPDS requirements. And just to say PPDS food does not include food that is packed at, at a customer's request or food made to order where it is not in packaging before being ordered. Um, and if it is in food that doesn't meet the definition, definition of, um, if the food is in some form of packaging, but it doesn't meet the precise definition of packaging, which um, I'll come to now. So the definition of food, of, of packaging that you need to adhere to with PPS food is packaging that encloses the food completely or only partially, but in any event in such a way that the contents can't be altered without opening or changing the packaging. So that's quite a technical uh, description, but essentially it means is if you change the packaging in some form to get to the food inside, it, if you can do that, it meets the definition of packaging that applies. But just to note, packaging does not need to be sealed to meet this definition. So it can include, for example, um, bags that are folded over or twisted because you still have to change the packaging to get into the food inside or boxes say that have tabs to shut them but aren't necessarily sealed. And also just a, a, a short note to say that the new labelling requirements don't uh, apply to any food that is sold through distance selling. So food that is sold through the internet or by telephone um, the, these rules don't apply, but you still need to make sure that you provide allergen information in the same way as you do now. So you must make allergen information available to the consumer before they purchase the product at the moment of sale and at the moment of delivery. So in terms of um, how you're you can be sure whether or not you're producing PPDS food, um, the FSA has produced a decision tree to help take you through the process to determine whether you're affected. Um, and this is available on our website. So essentially there are three key questions to consider. So is the food presented to the customer in packaging? Um, is it packaged before the customer selects or orders it? And is it packaged at the same place it is sold? Um, so if you can answer yes to all three questions, then you are producing PPDS food um, and you come under the new requirements. So something that um, could fall under these requirements is, for example, a burger that's been made on the same premises as which it is sold. So it's packed at 11.45, wrapped and under a hot lamp, ready for a lunch lunchtime rush. You can consider, is it presented to the consumer in packaging? Yes, it is, it's pre-packed. Is it packed before the customer orders it? Yes, so it's um, pre-packed. Um, is it packaged in the same place it is sold? Yes, so it meets the definition of pre-packed for direct sale. Um, so essentially for this type of food, from the 1st of October, you must provide information on the packaging or on a label attached to the packaging, specifying the name of the food and an ingredients list, including the 14 main allergens. And the allergens within the food must be emphasized every time they appear in the ingredients list. So for example, in capitals, bold, contrasting colors, or being underlined. Um, so just a bit more detail on, on the precise things needed for labeling. Um, and here you can see an example of what the labeling could look like. Um, so in terms of the name, it must be descriptive and inform the customer of the true nature of the food. So most foods will need a, a description of this kind. You can also use a customary name, which is commonly understood, um, such as a, a BLT sandwich. Um, where there are names prescribed in law, these must be used. And this mainly applies to food containing um, seafood, fish and, and meat ingredients. In terms of the ingredients list, it should be headed um, by a word, uh, word, by a phrase or the word ingredients. Um, it should include all the ingredients in the food, 
in descending order of weight. And if the product contains any of the 14 major allergens, they must be clearly highlighted in the ingredients list. In terms of the format and font, um, you must make sure that the information appears on the package, or as I said, on the label attached to the package. It must be easily visible and clearly legible. It must not be obscured in any way, and it must not be difficult to read, for example, due to poor lettering or colour contrast. Um, and there are legal requirements for the minimum font size. Um, so I've just listed it here where the X height needs to be 1.2 millimetres or more. But if you've got a packaging surface that's less than 80 centimetres square, the, the height of this can be reduced slightly. Labels can be handwritten, but they still need to meet uh, the, the legislative criteria on size and need to be easily visible and legible. And just to say, we often get questions um, asking whether quantitative ingredients declaration applies um, to PPDS products. So for PPDS food, it only applies to meat products. Now, a quid um, tells a consumer the percentage of a particular ingredient contained in a food product. Um, so you can give this information either as a percentage in brackets in the ingredients list after the name of the ingredient. So example, you specify pork 80% or also in or next to the name of the food. So putting it in the name rather than the ingredients list. Um, and just to reiterate, iterate, the food businesses and their suppliers already have an obligation to pass on accurate ingredients and allergen information to other food businesses and ensure that is passed on to the consumer. Um, and food businesses will also want to make sure that you've got processes in place to update any changes to ingredients um, and the allergens contained in a product. Um, so suppliers are legally responsible for passing on accurate information on ingredients and allergens already. That is something that should happen now. Um, and we're aware that's a, a particular concern for people now having to produce labels. You should be getting that information now already, um, but it's more the manner in which you're presenting that information to your consumer is now specified for this type of food. Um, I also just wanted to mention um, precautionary allergen labelling. Now, this is a type of labelling that aims to flag up where there might be the unintentional presence of an allergen, usually from unavoidable cross-contamination. So this often appears as statements such as may contain. Um, so you should only really provide this sort of statement if there's a real risk of allergen cross, cross contact that you've identified through a thorough risk assessment and where you can't remove the risk through risk management actions, for example, segregation or cleaning. Um, and any precautionary allergen labelling that is in ingredients that you use in your product should also be passed on to your consumer. Um, so you can, we advise that you put this kind of may contain or precautionary allergen labelling statement um, on the label as well, but legally you don't have to do this. You can also present it in another form, for example, um, on a sign on the premises. Um, we do, just to say, we do have some guidance on the use of um, precautionary allergen labelling that you can access um, on our website. Um, so here's a, just a few um, illustrative examples listed here, um, but just to particularly note, um, so for example, if you've got a deli bar where customers can purchase a freshly filled baguette um, and you put it into a package after someone orders it, that is not pre-packed for direct sale food. But if you packaged your baguette before customers ordered it, um, then it would be affected by the rules. Um, and then also just considering a situation where you're serving non pre-packed food, for example, on a plate, for example, in a school canteen, um, that is non pre-packed food and you should continue to provide allergen information the same way as you do now. But if you do package uh, certain foods before students order them, um, then that is PPDS and it would come under the new rules. Um, so just also to flag up um, the guidance we do have available. So there's a dedicated PPDS um, web uh, page on our website. 
um, and um, we are planning some some additions to that um, those resources over the next month or so. Um, but we also have the technical guidance, which was revised in June last year, which explicitly contains um, new text on PPDS food, as well as non uh, pre packed and pre packed food. So it tells you what allergen labeling and information requirements you have for each category. And we also have an online allergy and intolerance uh, e-training, which has been updated with content on PPDS food as well. And you can access that for free on our website. So just to reiterate, the changes come into force on the 1st of October. You can find more information on our website. You can also obtain business specific advice from your local authority. Um, and you can also send questions to our dedicated PPDS mailbox. So that's PPDS at food.gov.uk. So thank you. So stop, stop sharing. Thanks for that, um, Arvin. That was really informative and really useful. And I know that a few people have been asking questions about the availability of slides and the slides will be available as well as um, the actual, the whole webinar will be made available as well after the event. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Stevenson from Eridus. Hi there, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just share my screen with you. Two seconds. Great stuff. So you should all be able to see my screen now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm the customer support manager at Eridus, um, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Eridus data pool, which is a um, which is what's powering uh, Plan Glow's Label Logic Live solution uh, through a, an integration partnership that we have. So um, just to talk to you a little bit about what we do at Eridus. Um, well. We document, uh, pro we publish product specifications and make them available to wholesalers and caterers. So um, the, the core of our business all starts with a specification. We give uh, food and drinks manufacturers uh, access to a, a really robust specification system to document their food product data. So uh, there's 200, uh, there's more than 200 individual attributes of data available um, on the product specification. We also allow manufacturers to document their accreditations and their marketing assets as well, their, their, their product photography. Um, we also validate the data that manufacturers are inputting into the Eridus data pool to make sure that it's as accurate as it possibly can be. Um, we have, like I say, thousands of validations running against specifications every time they're published, uh, a new, every time a new specification is published, or every time a specification is amended or edited. Now, some of these validations are quite simple. Uh, you know, is there data in a mandatory field? Is that data the correct type of data? Um, but Eridus is now quite sophisticated in that the validation engine will actually read an ingredients declaration of a, uh, for a spe product specification and cross-reference it with things like the allergen declarations, the suitability for different dietary requirements to ensure that the claims that are being made are correct. Um, if, there, if there are any instances where there is a conflict, um, then you won't be, the manufacturers won't be able to publish that specification to make ensuring that accurate data is being pushed out across the industry. Um, we also, you know, in terms of data accuracy and validity, we, um, we ask manufacturers to, in, to regularly confirm that their data is being managed, is up to date and is accurate as well. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's how we manage sort of single specifications and single manufacturers. But we're now at a point where the Eridus communal data pool has 43, well, more than 43,000 individual product specifications um, available in the data pool at present. Um, any new products that are published to the data pool or any product changes that are made to existing specifications are, um, are made available instantly. The data pool is, is a live resource. Any, any changes that are made, anything that's um, published is instantly available. And all of this product data is available 24 seven, 365. So yeah, it's an online resource. Um, wholesalers and caterers can log in and access this data whenever they need to. Um, we make all of the data uniform and easy to consume. Um, so, you know, every, every specification is in the same format. So, you know, if you're, a, if you're a wholesaler or a caterer getting specifications from different sources, you know, one specification might be very different to another. Um, you know, the uniformity of this data makes it so much easier to consume. And because we're an online resource, um, 
we, uh, we can make this data available automatically and programmatically through our API, which is effectively just a data feed that can be used to power all sorts of solutions um, uh, within the food service industry and beyond. You know, we have our own suite um, of caterers tools. We have a, an allergen and nutritional data search tool, a recipe builder, and a menu planner that, um, that is powered by the data set within Eridus. But the API can also be used to power um, wholesale solutions, um, e-commerce platforms. You know, you can pull allergen and nutritional information out uh, and product imagery as well to power um, to publish uh, product listings on your e-commerce platform. Or you can have all of this data um, used to power your internal systems like PIM solutions and ERP solutions as well. Uh, and we also have third party integration partners that use the API to power their solutions like Label Logic Live and PlanGlow. Um, uh, using the Eridus data set, which is validated to be as accurate as it possibly can be from source um, to power to power their food service solutions as well. Um, the, the reach of the API that we have is increasing, um, just like the number of product specifications we have. Um, and at, you know, at, the, at the time of writing these slides, we are currently tracking over a million API calls to our API on a weekly basis. And um, that's, that's one million product specifications being pushed out somewhere, uh, product changes um, all across um, the, the food industry. So um, yeah, frictionless communication of accurate product data, a million, over a million different bits of data getting changed, updated, published on a weekly basis, massive reach. Um, so yeah, that's that, that's pretty much us. Um, so just to summarize, we uh, at Eridus offer really robust specification data straight from source, directly from the manufacturer. It's managed by the manufacturer um, and we, we have multiple data integrity checks to ensure that the data that's being received is accurate. Um, there's a massively increasing reach for the of accurate data through the Eridus API, but also, you know, we've got, it can be accessed through a web portal and, you know, the more people get behind this solution and more manufacturers start coming on board and adding their product specification, we are effectively becoming um, a dedicated single source of truth for the food service industry uh, when it comes to uh, product data. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Andrew. That was really no worries. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to share my screen and just give you a bit of background to Banglo and then Kai's going to talk through our uh, Label Logic Live software solution. Right, so next, for those that aren't familiar, I'm going to give you a bit of background about Planglo. We're the people behind the market leading label printing software, Label Logic Live. We've been supplying catering businesses of all sizes across the world with labels and software for over 35 years and more recently, compostable packaging. One of the unique things about us and our Label Logic Live software is that it's specifically designed for the food to go sector. Our software is used by over 6,000 customers and since the announcement of Natasha's Law, we have been working with our customers of all sizes from multi-site caterers. We cover over three quarters of the contract caterer market and work with many universities, schools, hospitals, right through to independent bakers and sandwich shops to get them Natasha's Law compliant. So no matter what size business you are, our system works for you. We pride ourselves on our service and support. We have dedicated regional account managers, as well as a team of support experts who are on hand to talk you through the whole process and answer any questions should you need us. Our software has evolved with the needs of our customers. Our latest version is browser-based. This means that no installation is required and that any in updates are instant. It also means that your software is always compliant with the latest legislation, including Natasha's law. The software has been designed with ease of use at its core. All you need to print labels is an internet connected device to run the software and any printer and you're set, which means that no investment in hardware is required. Label Logic Live can be tailored to your business to comply with Natasha's law. It incorporates recipe building functionality with Eridus built in to provide seamless branded product and wholesaler data, which automatically highlights the allergens in bold. And if you already use a recipe management program, we have integrations with all of the leading recipe management systems, so you don't have to manually re-enter your data. We are always on hand to support our customers whenever they need us with lots of resources, including live chat and YouTube tutorials. I'm now going to hand over to Kai Mundy to run you through the software. Hello, my name is Kai. I'm a member of the support team here at Planglow. So before we jump in, I'd like to say that the Labor Logic Live 
application is extremely flexible tool for you to utilize. We've decided to only scratch the surface of his capabilities during this demo. So if you would like to explore further, please contact us for a three months trial. Now I'll jump into the application and show you what you would typically be doing day to day. Here is the print center. You will spend a few moments daily selecting products to print for that day or week's production run. You can use print list to organize products however you see fit. The majority of our customers will have a print list for their daily print run, weekly print run. Other customers will organize by different product groups. I'm just going to select a few products to print and we'll see that print happening in real time. Taking special care not to miss the expiry date here. And then here on the screen is the generated PDF that you would send down to the printer. Going back into the software, I'm just gonna head over to the product center. The product center is where you do all, the, all of the product entry. We have categories that you can create to organize your products. The majority of people would create different categories for different product types. However, this is completely up to you to organize as you like. I'm going to set up a category called Panini to store my Panini products. It will now allow me to choose what fields I'd like in my category. To name a few, you can see we have barcodes, allergens, calculated shelf life fields, and you can utilize these to display whatever information you may need on your label. Further down the line, if I wanted to add the nutritional or reference intakes fields, I would just have to come back into here and enable them. The products within the category could then generate the information based on the recipe we set up for the product. For this demo, I will add the title, price, recipe, and ingredients fields. Just scroll down and click save on that one. Now I'm going to go into the newly created product category and create a product. For this one, I'm gonna go for a BLT Panini at price of 1.99. And now the next step is for us to build our product. Uh, this is like making it in the kitchen. So be sure to add everything you would typically include in that product. First of all, I'm gonna add the smoked bacon. Here you can see I have different filters set. Um, what this is doing is it's filtering all the different wholesalers I have enabled on the account. Um, as you can see, I only have a small selection of the wholesalers available on this demo account. Um, if you would like a wholesaler enabled on your account, please contact support at planglow.com. Now I'm just gonna add the rest of the ingredients of the product. We'll go for some Lettuce. Add that one on. Next, I'm going to search for my tomato, uh, but I'll use the product code for this one. So I can be sure that I'm getting the right product. And lastly, I'm gonna add the panini rolls. Once you've finished adding all of the ingredients, it's important to enter the correct weights for each ingredient, as it will affect the ordering of the items within the ingredients field. I'm now going to link the recipe that we just built to the ingredients field. You can see that the ingredients are listed in descending order and any allergens present have been bolded. Uh, the product is now set up. I don't think that was my fastest time to be honest with you, but we'll have you labeling confidently in no time at all. Once that product has been saved, you can always go back into your products and edit any of the information. Now what I'll do is go over to the template designer. The template designer will allow you to design templates for your needs. Some of you may want to add a logo or tweak the positions of where the details of your product print on the label. Um, in addition to our stock labels, Planglo can provide bespoke label designs. If you have a bespoke label design with us, you will see that appear here. We have lots of our stock labels set up with compliant templates you can use. If you're using one of our smaller label offerings, such as the Gastro 16 per sheet, we have set up two part labels. So you can use these to print a front and a back label that includes the ingredient listings on the back. I'm going to use our gastro six label here 
And I'm going to choose our Natasha's Law Compliant template to make some changes to. Now the labels on the screen, what I want to do here is change the font and I'm going to upload a logo. So once I've clicked onto the title field, you can see I've got loads of edit options down the left hand side. I'm just going to simply change the font to one of the other ones. Within here, you can change the font, the font size, font color, the alignment. That's only some of the options you have available within that. And I've identified that I need to uh, just move that one down a little bit to get my logo onto the label. I'm going to just upload my logo now. Now that the logo has been uploaded, I'm going to position that where I want it to print. And just so I know that one's centered, I'm going to go back over to the edit tab and use the alignment tool. For the ingredients box on the back, I'm going to set a minimum font size. Uh, what this would do is it will warn us if the font size drops below the specified size when generating the label PDF. Uh, this is an important requirement for the Natasha's Law legislation, as there'll be much more information printed on the back of the label, um, or sorry, or wherever the ingredients are on the label. And we need to ensure that this can be read. Uh, as previously mentioned, the height of the font must be equal to or greater than 1.2 millimeters. So for this font on the screen, I'm going to be using the font size of seven and setting that as my minimum. We will now save the changes we made to this one. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to the print center and use the template that we just created for the Panini product we, we created earlier. So I'm just gonna first set up a new print list. I could add that Panini product to any of the existing print lists, but I'm going to make a new one just for an example. And we're going to choose the label that we're using, which is the Gastro 6. And then you can see the template that we have set up earlier in the template designer. I'll now add the Panini product onto the print list and enter in a quantity that I want to print. Now that I click the print button, I'm taking special care to make sure any prompt fields, print time prompt fields have been entered. In this case, I need to enter the expiry date. And then we'll click the print button. What that would do then is it would generate us the Panini product on the template that we just designed. So you can see that one's been personalized how we wanted it. And then next thing to do is just send that one down to the printer. Before I hand you back to Rachel, I'd just like to mention that the support team here at Planglo pride itself on the support we can provide. Anyone can provide you with labels to stick, but we believe our level of support is unrivaled. We have been continuously updating our tutorial videos on our YouTube channel. You can also find these embedded within the application here, just under the video tutorials heading. Or if you prefer, you can always reach out to us for support. We can do one-to-one -one support. We can do training sessions. Um, if you'd like to reach us via more traditional means of contact, such as telephone or email, you can do that. Or we do have a live chat that's integrated within the application just down in the bottom right. Um, just, just pop up on that one, so I'm gonna respond back to you. We're now able to set you up within minutes, so please contact Planglo if you want to get started. Great, thanks very much, Kai, for that. Um, I'm now gonna hand you back to Andrew from Eridus again. Hey there guys, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen with you and I'm just going to have a little bit of a chat to you all about sort of allergen management in the kitchen, sort of best practices to adhere to. Um, not going to be going into it in a massive amount of detail, but you know, like I say, this is just sort of best practices. So um, I guess the first thing to sort of talk about when um, when discussing allergen management in the workplace or in the kitchen is um, well, the first thing that you need to do is to be able to actually identify the allergens that, are you, that you're handling within your business. Um, so uh, make sure you know all of the 14 major allergens um, for, as, for, as a start uh, and then you know you, you need to assess what allergens are actually being handled. So you'll need to audit all of your added, all of the allergenic ingredients within your business. Um, this process can be made much easier uh, by using uh, software solutions such as Eridus, using the communal data pool, but it can also be done as a manual task as well. Um, great, uh, great best practice when uh, to, to help you identify allergens uh, is always audit deliveries. Um, check all deliveries that come through your business to ensure that all food coming in matches the order that you have made. Um, if there are any substitutions in your food delivery, then be sure to check the ingredients label as well never ever ever assume the allergenic 
the content of a new product or a substitute product. Um, you know, there could be mustard powder in a new brand of mayonnaise that you've, that you've purchased, um, or there could be celery seeds in a new brand of spice mix that you're getting or something that's been substituted. So always, always, always check for, um, check for the, any new allergens or, or, or hidden allergens um, in any um, new products or substitute products that you get. Um, and always make sure to check out for may contain statements on, on ingredients declarations as well. Um, as you know, it, it only takes a very small amount of an allergen to, to cause a reaction, um, and you know, if somebody does suffer from allergies, um, you know, a may contains is almost as good as a, as a, as a does contain uh, in most instances. So make sure that, uh, that you're aware of what, what may contains uh, statements around your ingredients. So once you've identified the allergens within your within your business, you need to perform a, a risk assessment. So you know, we need to firstly uh, identify any hazard control points that could uh, lead to cross contamination of any allergens within the kitchen. Um, you know, for instance, to just talked about deliveries. That's going to probably be your first hazard control point. You know, is there any damaged packaging for any of the products that could cause cross contamination? Is your is your milk um, is your milk container leaking? Is your is your is your flour bag, pierce, that sort of stuff. Um, Cross-contamination management is vital when it comes to uh, when it comes to allergen management um, within the kitchen. Um, always make sure to use dedicated storage for allergenic ingredients. There, you know, there may be times when you don't keep food or ingredients in its original packaging. Um, if you do use separate food containers to store food within your business, um, even after a thorough cleaning of a container that's held one of the 14 major allergens, particles may remain in that container and may potentially cause an allergic reaction. So um, make sure you're, you're using dedicated storage if you're, using, uh, if you're not using the original packaging. Um, Again, use you know you talk about using dedicated storage. Also, make sure, where possible, use dedicated uh, dedicated prep area and equipment for allergen-free food prep. Um, obviously, this isn't possible in every single kitchen. Um, kitchens are all um, kitchens are all very very different uh, shapes and sizes. But you know where possible, it is best practice to use dedicated um, a dedicated prep area um, and dedicated um, equipment as well. Uh, to, to minimize that risk of cross-contamination. Um, in instances where dedicated equipment can't be used, make sure that you uh, clean uh, clean anything, uh, clean that equipment uh, following best practice and good hygiene, uh, cleaning best practice and good hygiene. Um, two-stage cleaning method, using a detergent or a cleaning product first to scrub the equipment and remove visible dirt, and then using a disinfectant um, at the sort of recommended dilution um, for the stated contact time on whatever disinfectant you use uh, and make sure to rinse it with, with clean water if necessary. Um, as well, talking about sort of good cleaning practice, be mindful when cleaning up spills. Um, for van allergenic ingredients, try and use disposable paper towels and not reusable um, sort of dishcloths and things like that because, you know, you might, you might mop up some milk with a dishcloth and you might use that to, on something else later on um, and that, that's you know that's that's cross-contamination right there um, and again I it was mentioned before but you know only use a may contain statement um, when there is a genuine risk of um, of cross-contamination uh, after after performing a risk assessment um, so yeah identify the allergens manage the risk but arguably the most important um, the most important step in uh, managing allergens within your business is, is training your employees. Um, every single employee within your food business will need to be trained on the allergen management procedures that have been implemented within your organization or within your company or uh, food service uh, operation. Um, front of house employees will need to be able to reliably inform customers that have queries about your allergen management processes to instill confidence in the customer that they aren't going to suffer an allergic reaction. Um, and also to know what resources are available to them to answer any specific questions. Do the employees know where to get, you know, where an allergen matrix can be found? Do they know um, about all the different allergens that are, that are handled within the kitchen? Um, make sure that you regularly review and record the training of all employees when you are training employees within your organization. Um, regularly reviewing the allergen um, practice, uh, allergen management practice with practices within your business will um, keep allergen management a focal point of conversation within your company and um, 
you know, keep the conversation going with, with regards to it because it'll be being discussed on a regular basis. And by recording the training of all your employees, you know, you're, you're ensuring that, you know, your employees have gone through the correct training. Um, God forbid, if there was an incident, you know, you're, you're being compliant, you've got document, you've got documentation to say that you have been compliant, people have gone through training and, um, and it has been recorded and signed by the employee. Um, you know, you can have the absolute best allergen management um, practices, you can dream them up and think them up uh, but and, and implement them within your business. But if the employees don't know how to follow them, um, then it all falls down there as well. So just be mindful of that. Um, so yeah, that's a, the th sort of three pillars. Um, identify the allergens, manage the risk, assess the risk, and make sure your employees know how to, uh, and make sure your employees are adequately trained. Thanks ever so much, Andrew. That was really useful and informative. I'm now going to um, pass you on to Paula Young from Petrock College. And Paul is going to talk us through the process she has been through to get her products PPDS compliant. Hi, yeah, uh, yeah, we already use PlanGo for our labels. Um, and when our rep introduced us to Label Logic Live, we felt that this software offered us all the allergen, nutritional, and calorific information that we wanted to see on our labels. Um, obviously, this allows the staff and students complete transparency about what they are buying so they can make their own safe choices about what they want to eat. And then obviously with Natasha's law coming into effect from October, um, we wanted to be fully compliant. Um, so we've already implemented the information onto the system. And now we're looking at the labels, which will work best on all of our packaging. So hopefully, well, we will be ready to use in September of the start of our new term. Um, so how we manage the process. Um, we produce a list of all the pre-packed food for direct sale that is sold in our catering areas like cakes, pastries and sandwiches. Um, and then we place the product codes next to these items, which is checked against our invoicing um, and our online ordering history from Philip Dennis. Um, and then we looked at the allergens and the nutritional information that was already available and asked if Plango we we'll work together with Eurydas and Philip Dennis so we could have their food data software, which would then provide us the information from the manufacturers that they use and that the products that we sell. Um, this has been really beneficial teaming up with Eurydas and Philip Dennis as this has ensured the accurate information is correct on the products that we buy in. And then they obviously keep us informed of any changes to any of the allergens and the changes in any of the ingredients. Um, and then obviously that makes our process a lot easier because then we can upload onto the system um, the, the information um, and all the nutritional value that we need, which then make, makes it easier for us to produce the labels um, because obviously the ingredients are there ready for us to use. Um, so how we manage this, um, <coughs> each area is given an order form uh, which they use, which has the product description and product code so this is then completed by a member of staff from each outlet. So then when I process the orders myself, we use the Philip Dennis online ordering system. So this ensures that the codes that are actually on our order sheets actually match the products that actually come into our food outlets. And then to make sure that this is safe, um, once the food comes in, we then check the invoices against the order forms, which then ensures the accuracy of the product. And then if there has been any substitutes or anything that has been sent in incorrectly, then we can stop it there. And then we can either send it back straight away or we put it to one side, which then is not used. And then that, that allows us then to have the accurate products that are coming through. Um, so, so we just basically, it's check, check, check all the time. Um, and then once then we obviously have got the food on site, we know it's the right codes. Um, obviously then the staff are using the food that comes in. We know then that the labels that we are using, that we have then implemented onto the system by picking up the codes from Philip Dennis, we know that that information then is accurate on our labels because how I work, where you saw um the setup of the labels i actually don't put in bacon i actually pick up the code which then brings uh, say it's um 
a code for bacon of AO1 something. If I type that in, then Philip Dennis's then code system comes straight into the label logic live system. So then I am aware that every product that I am picking that I order is actually coming from Philip Dennis, which then uploads onto the labels. So I know then that it, that information on the labels is correct. So hopefully there, we know that there is no difference in, a, in say cheese or um, a sandwich spread. I'm picking exactly from Philip Dennis, which then comes from their warehouse, which then gets checked once the food comes in. So there are our sort of, um, our tight checks really that we, that we manage on site. Um, and then really how we manage these practicalities is again, um, complete staff training and making sure that all staff are aware of allergens. Um, it's my job to update um, and make sure all of the order forms are correct at all times. And then obviously the staff constantly check in when the invoices come through that the products are correct. And then again, just working closely with our suppliers um, making sure that if a product is not available, then we don't want a substitute. Um, but then obviously those checks are in place to see if anything like that does come through from Philip Dennis. We are then on hand to check it and to obviously, like I say, send it back. Um, and there, there really are checks really to make sure that when we are up and running, that we are compliant and that we're trying to reduce the risk as much as we can. Thanks, Paula. That's really useful and um, yeah, just um, really helpful and in practical insights for all those caterers out there that are looking to get compliant right now. Um, thank you. So we're just going to round this up with um, a Q&A panel session with all of our guest speakers. I know we have got a huge number of questions that have come in. Um, and if we don't get through them all, we are going to provide answers to them on both our websites um, so that people will be able to, to find the answers to them and the FSA will be doing the same. Um, so if we just want to join everyone now, we've also got um, Neil Steadman joining us, who's our corporate director. And we also have um, Stephen Hendry from Food Standards Scotland. Andrew, um, Arvin, shall I just kick off with a couple of questions that have um, come in that I think would be relevant? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, go ahead. Brill. So someone's been asked specifically about vending machines and products stored in vending machines. Um, and I was just wondering if you could provide us with some guidance. Um, yeah, so on vending machines, um, the same allergen information rules as now apply. Um, so you don't have to make um, any changes specifically because of the new um, PPDS rules. Um, so a lot of food sold in vending machines will be pre-packed food. So that will be labelled appropriately already, for example, bags of crisps and chocolates. Um, so that's labelled already and you put that into the machine. But for pre-packed for direct sale food, um, which you're packaging on the premises or non-pre-packed food, um, you need to make information on the 14 allergens available in some form. So this could be on the machine itself or next to it or on the item of food itself, if possible. So that's specifically information on the 14 allergens. Um, you don't need to do a full ingredients list. Great. Um, and someone's asked a question about micro businesses. Um, what level of accuracy is acceptable um, on the labels? Um, well, the, the legislation is the, the legislation and each business will need to find a way of meeting the requirements that fits in with their own business model. Um, so you will need, if you produce PPDS food, you will need to be compliant with the um, requirements from the 1st of October. Um, and also we do encourage businesses to talk to their local authorities as well for business specific advice too. So you can sort of sense check with them whether the approach you're taking is the right one. Um, you personally will want to make sure that the labelling is accurately representing the ingredients contained in the food. So you'll want to make sure that you're getting accurate information from your suppliers. And as I said earlier, legally, accurate information should be passed on through the food supply chain to, to the end consumer. Um, just in terms of enforcement, local authorities in, generally should, in general should be taking a proportionate approach to enforcement, um, in the, particularly in the early months. Um, and they'll want to provide businesses with advice and guidance in the first instances. 
Um, but yeah, that will be a proportionate and risk-based approach. And if they, they'll have to decide if they need to escalate it depending on seriousness of any non-compliance, but it should be a proportionate supportive approach um, in the early months, particularly. Great, thank you for that. Um, does the law cover Scotland? Stephen, you might be best uh, placed to answer that one. Hi, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, yes, it, yes, it does. And it, it comes into force on the 1st of October, the same day as the rest of the UK. Perfect. Um, and so what would happen to labelling if the catering manager was off work? For example, if he manages the labelling system to start to finish on his site. Paula, how do you manage this when you're um, not when you're not around? Yeah, there's a team of us really. There's three or four of us that have, um, have use of the um, system. So if I wasn't here, then there's a catering manager and there's the chef. Um, and also as well, when we look to work to, with the labels, I do also get the manager and the chef to look over them as well. So we're just double checking. So we've all got an awareness of all of the labels that we're using. Perfect, thank you. And I'm just looking through some of the questions that we've just had come in live as well. So it says, would this mean that gluten would have to be included on all labels as may contain as it is airborne and likely gluten containing products will be handled in the same kitchen prep areas? Um, so, so on that, again, it, it's important to do a risk assessment. Yeah. So you need to do a risk assessment before you use any form of um, precautionary allergen labelling like may contain. Um, and the FSA does have some guidance on this in our Safer Food, Better Business uh, guidance, which if you Google, you should be able to find online. Perfect. And someone also said um, they work in a cafe where they put a salad, um, salads in boxes, but showcase them without lids in a refrigerated deli counter. We put the lids on after the customers ordered it. Is this subject to the labelling requirements? No, it's important here to remember the definition of packaging. So the food needs to completely or partially encase the food so the food can't be altered in any way. So if you've just got an open um, uh, box with no lid, then the food can be accessed and changed in some way. Um, so if, if, that, if it's in that form, when the customer orders it, it doesn't come under the new requirements, but you still should make allergen information available in some form. Yeah. Um, I work in a school kitchen and make sandwiches daily. They're then placed in a paper bag and given to the children. Do I have to label every sandwich or would an allergen sheet from the council be sufficient? I guess it just depends on, uh, you know, yeah, so it depends when the order is made. So yeah. if if the parent made a specific order for a student in advance, um, then that would count as food made to order. Um, but if you just provided an array of packaged sandwiches and the student came along and chose one, um, then that would be PPDS and it would need labelling. Yeah. Um, I know there's lots of different permutations on um, how you order food. Um, but, but generally, I think those, those two criteria should, should help you decide whether you're uh, non-prepacked or prepacked for direct sale. Great. Um, next, we've got one from Linda Bowes. What about buffet food that is packed for customers for coded secure reasons? Do we ask if they would like this to be done and treat as non-prepacked? So I guess, um, I guess, again, if they're ordering the food beforehand, yeah, so with buffets, again, it depends on the specific setup that you've got. So um, so PPDS rules do apply to, apply to single items or you know, the single item that a consumer will take. So if you're sort of covering a tray of um, big sandwiches, um, but you're planning that individuals will come and take, um, yeah, they might take the lid off and then take individual sandwiches, that's probably non-prepacked food. But yeah, if food is ordered in advance and made to order, then it doesn't come under the PPS rules. And if, if people are accessing a big plate and then putting it onto their own plate, that's non-prepacked food. But if you are providing individually wrapped things on a buffet um, that's wrapped before someone makes a choice, then that would be PPDS. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we're going to have to wrap this up though, but I'm just going to ask one final question. In the case of small labels being used for PPDS products, this was from Anne McDonald, less than uh, 10 centimetres. Um, does the food business need to provide a full ingredient list or just the allergens? 
I, I think um, beneath a certain size, it should it's just the allergens. Um, but I think that's that's something we can sort of clarify, look into and just specifically clarify on. Great. Yeah. Thanks ever so much, Arvind. So I think we're just going to have to wrap that up now, and we will we will endeavour to you know answer your quick questions that you've raised as quickly as and soon as possible. Um, we are, we're going to make them available on our website, and we'll also make the webinar and available to anyone that was unable to attend. Um, thank you to all our panelists that have taken part today, and to everyone for listening. And if you do require any further support regarding Natasha's Law, please contact either Eregis or Planglow um, or the Food Standards Agency for further information. Thanks ever so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you.